Oshinoko has never been more back. Over a year ago, I came out of hiatus to make a video on Oshinoko's first episode because one of my favorite manga had a movie-length opener that I was so excited about, I had to share my passion for all its small directional choices that I loved. And now, Oshinoko is back, both literally airing once again while also adapting my favorite arc that I am so excited about that I have to share my passion for all of its small directional choices that I love. I've got three in mind, and where better to start than on the very first shot? An almost three minute one take placing us in the spot of an audience member watching the opening of the stage play that makes up this arc. And you can sell me on basically anything with a long shot alone, but this also works for me on a few other axes. First off, framing. Oshinoko welcomes us to consider the performances from the perspective of the actors and idols. This is arguably its strongest point, but in this moment it's inverting that dynamic to make us purely viewers, without that behind the scenes or internal thought process awareness that made up so much of our previous performances, like Sweet Today's filming, for example. Without that context, we're simply along for the introduction, and that creates a contrast when, after the OP plays, we're suddenly weeks before going through rehearsals learning about what the actual emotional stakes are for the stage play. By the time we get back to said performance episodes from now, the texture of what the screen's opening means for our cast will be totally different for us than our fellow audience members in this shot, just as unaware as we were here. In that same vein, this is a pretty low stakes situation to get a gist of the medium. This is not your grandpappy's stage. We've got giant moving screens and cameras to capture the nuance in performance that you wouldn't catch in the back of a traditional theater. It's not much, but it's good info to have in the back of your head during the rehearsal period. And it's also introducing the audience to the play's aesthetics, so that when we hear music and see manga panels that don't vibe with Oshinoko's style, we already know what it's in service of. But. I know the scene that everyone wants to talk about, so let's do that. The build-in has one minor touch that I need to mention. Grayscaling the shots minus the attention character has the obvious build-in of here's who we're focusing on, like Aqua looking at the director, but it's cleverly used to highlight Kana's talent of blending in with the quality of her castmates by having her bright color extinguish as she passes by Melt, an inferior actor by all accounts. Which makes the following sequence utterly incredible. In a scene designed to show how bringing in outsiders like Kana and Aqua can level up the talent of the acting troupe, Oshinoko doubles down on its color symbolism, introducing Himekawa as he splashes the scene in bright yellow, painting Kana and the room in it, pulling her inexorably into her character as shown in one of my favorite shots from the year, my god the way that Tsurugi appears. You can intuit just from the way Himekawa enters the scene, the sharp white background which contrasts so well with the yellow, the three-part close-ups, that he's the real deal. Which is funny because his actual walk-in isn't notable, a background element in a conversation because he hasn't turned it on yet. Underrated in this sequence is the sound. The soundtrack plays until Himekawa enters, and then just stops with a little bit of reverb for a moment before the splash crests over the soundscape. I know it's supposed to be paint, and I think it works on that level, but I hear water. And that gives it another layer, because if La La Lai is indeed stagnant, then this is a splash in the pond sending ripples out in all directions, forcing the cast to change. Kana, pulled into the world of the story, seeing Himekawa as Blade, snaps out of it, looking around before realizing that she can now work at a much higher level. Suddenly the music kicks in, but instead of Oshinoko's normal audio fare, this is much more in line with the aesthetics of a shonen battle series, which makes sense for Tokyo Blade, and each swing of their script like a katana is instead a paintbrush, coloring the soundstage and their castmates. The implication being that they too are entranced in this show of ability and are being forcefully brought into the scene, as shown in the last shot where the paint literally becomes a gateway into the image, and simultaneously, as Kana did, feel the need to get to that level of performance. The cuts have so much intention. Kana and Hanekawa get these complex moves in rotation that are full of life and energy, and when Aqua and Akane are shown, they are stationary, helplessly watching on. There's also, of course, the text of the scene, the dialogue that delights in both the literal and metaphorical combat. It's just such a joy to watch and engage with. To see Kana after Sweet Today get to strut her skills brings a smile to my face. It's a standout moment in a series that has had dozens of great standout moments, and that full transition into the scene as it would be 
shown in the manga or on stage is chef's kiss. That level of transformation in the skill of the two actors to change the very background they stand on is a testament to their ability within the fiction of the story. There's plenty of other small stuff, like the decision to focus purely on the mangaka's face when she asks for full rewrites to maximize their voice's tonal change, and that this is a request that cannot be ignored for it is the original creator. The cute chibi faces getting thrown here and there, the stuff with the Sweet Today's author is hilarious. And the section where the screenwriter and director are talking about the process of adaptation from manga to a runtime medium like a stage play, and how that forces tough cuts for conveying ideas and emotions is absolutely one of the reasons I love love this arc so much, and I think is captured extremely well in this split screen and the following highlights to simplify complex characters into two straightforward factions. I promised myself I wouldn't get into the weeds of the adaptation, but hiding the mangaka's concern until she asked for rewrites instead of foreshadowing a problem midway through, previous chapter as the manga did it, I think is for the better. The genuine surprise and the new lane for conflict on a production level is a great cliffhanger. But the other big element I love from this episode is, of course, Akane's visualization via puzzle pieces and how it reflects her character. The slow fade into pure white as the dialogue is replaced by the soundtrack is done really well. It's a natural way to transition into Akane's headspace while maintaining her isolation from the cast who's figured their characters out like Kana. Similarly, I think the use of the Tokyo Blade characters as they would appear in their manga as opposed to the actors portraying them is understated but really effective. Especially when you realize that Saya is the only one who stays black and white, while Toki and Tsurugi have colored outlines, representative of just a little bit more depth that Akane could plumb into for meaning. And then, this shot. I don't have to say anything here because it's such a simple and elegant way to convey the way that Akane's process works and the problem she's struggling with. For what it's worth, this is undoubtedly the second best shot in the episode. Ai's puzzle is pretty close to complete. There's some stuff missing on the edges, but the core stuff is basically all present. Akane's got a pretty good grasp on Ai. She deduced plenty of hidden stuff in episode 8. Meanwhile, Sai is almost unrecognizable and missing so much of the base that any deductions would be pure conjecture. And that contrast between Source Saya and Script Saya blasting away in puzzle pieces is just perfect, since any part of the solution that Script Saya could provide is simply too different and basic. The final shot of Saya's eye in a puzzle piece, the script, and the manga volume, all of which conflict and contrast, leaving Akane with no foundation to work with, is particularly interesting to me because it really shows that she's isolated in her process. The following shot has her on an empty background. This isn't something that she opens up to others, and outside of taking feedback, she's not rushing over to the director and screenwriter for their takes. Her pretty innocuous comment of, isn't the script different than the manga gets parsed by Aqua correctly, and then he jumps in to get her help. In that vein, this is a low-stakes version of her struggles during the reality show filming, and a similarly low-stakes solution provided by Aqua. I only bring this up because, god, the puzzle shot is just so good, but it's also a testament to how consistent the characters are, even in moments that aren't grandiose. Akane is a loner by nature. She relates to Aqua sitting alone earlier this episode, after all, and her process is just a reflection of her self-reliance, even to her detriment. The stage play arc, or as I refer to it with my friends, the Tokyo Blade arc, is my absolute favorite because of the way it asks and tackles questions of adaptation and the philosophies of doing so. It's also great character work with interesting interpersonal conflicts and payoffs, and this episode largely just lays the groundwork for them with aplomb. I could not be more excited to see how Oshinoko's second season adapts the rest of this material, and I promise if it's particularly interesting I'll be back to talk about it at arc's end, a promise I will almost certainly have to follow through on, because if I can gush about a 3 minute wonder, the sound design of paint that sounds like water, and how characterization is maintained even in internal visualizations, who knows what the rest of this arc will have to offer. Oshinoko is so fucking back.